And we're back once again. I'm Ashman. And I'm Cookcell. And we are playing Saya no Uta, or The Song of Saya. Um, last time, uh, Saya and our main man, Fuminori, ran away from their home. They are hiding out in some old sanatorium, which is which sounds fun. And they are plotting to kill Koji, lure him out, and finally kill him. So that's fun. Uh, Koji, ha we, we were given an option. Koji found out that Omi is, unfortunately, not in the land of the living anymore. Is in, in, as, uh, actually, in fact, taking a little holiday in the fridge. So, um, he didn't like that. He's pissed. We were given an option to either call Fuminori di uh, or call Yeah, you Ryoko. can call Fuminori or you can call Ryoko. Yeah. And I... S I think we we had a chat about it, but I suspect calling Fuminori would have been a bad idea because we would have went straight to him and probably been ambushed again. Uh, so we decided to call Ryoko, and she's told us to lay low. She's coming back to town, and we're going to partner up, buddy style, and we're going to cause some mayhem. So Just like all the old good movies, yeah? Buddy cop movies, weapon. yeah. Get the guns out, just Rush guns are blazing. Hour. <laughs> bah, 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 bah. Fucking, I'm gonna shoot. At, it's like shoot first, ask questions later. Um, that's how I imagine it. It's maybe going to be a little bit different, being a visual novel I, and not a f action movie from the eighties. But I mean, that kind of change in tone isn't all that uh, dissim dissimilar to what happened at the ending of Time Hollow, which just completely changed tack. It's not that it became an action movie at the end. It's just that because of stuff that happened in it, what started off as one story just ended up feeling like. Something where people just didn't give a shit anymore. Time Hollow? Not heard of that. Time one. Hollow. Oh, Time Hollow. It's a, uh, a, a visual novel on the DS. I played it when I was younger. Oh, that sounds interesting. Um, hmm. Might have a look at that at some point. So we seem to be in someone's room. He has a nice TV and laptop, so he's doing well for himself for the early 2000s. I thought this was in the 90s, but I think 2001 or something was mentioned, so... This probably uh, was in the early 2000s or something. I mean, early or mid 2000s would explain things like camera phones, um, <laughs> which have been popping up every now and then. And I've been confused by it, thinking, what the fuck? Is Japan really in the future or something? Dude, I can't remember. I thought camera phones were like my my uh, memory of technology when it came out b before 2010 is blurry at best. Um, I, I just think back to my childhood and I'm like, did we have phones? Did we have camera phones? When did we have all this? Like, And I tried to relate it to what stages of school I was in. That's the only way I can sort of keep in mind at what time different bits of tech came out. What doesn't help is that we were generally behind the curve. Yeah, I think uh, I remember kids having really shit camera phones when I was at school. I didn't, of course, because my fa I don't have a phone. Um, so yeah, I suppose the early 2000s. Oh, am I showing my age? <laughs> I'm 25 if anyone asks. Otherwise, you know, fucking you better believe it. Um, 20 years old forever. Yeah, that's it. 25, 20 years old. <laughs> 21 forever <laughs> uh, um, yes shall we continue absolutely the hands of his watch move with agonizing slowness as though counting down to the end of the world in the hours since contacting Ryoko Koji went back to his apartment showered, changed clothes and even had his first full meal in days which was probably a good idea because he uh, he was covered in mud and had spent like 36 hours without food. Oof. In that well. He wanted to take a nap, knowing that he needed the rest, but no matter how hard he tried, sleep never came. Forcing himself to relax only made his nerves colder and sharper. You know this feeling. <laughs> With nothing else to do, he decides to wander the city until nightfall. <laughs> Papa Sonic, have a look. Oh my days. Just, uh oh. Downtown, downtown Do Tokyo is bustling. 
Surrounded by smiling pedestrians, bright lights and window de windows decorated early for Christmas, it feels as if all of the happiness in the world has been gathered in this very place. Yes, if your idea of happiness is like the capitalist way of Christmas, I suppose. Especially uh. in Japan. I mean, he didn't get KFC, so he's not properly enjoying it. <laughs> Koji takes it all in, burning it into his memory like it's the last thing he'll ever see. Is the world so beautiful because of the horrors that lurk in its shadows? The glow of the city can no longer warm him. Perhaps that is why it seems so precious. Koji watches the city for hours. He feels unreachably distant, like reading the obituary of someone you loved long ago. His phone rings at 8pm. Ryoko. The conversation is short. She hangs up as soon as they decide where to meet. And so ends Tono Koji's final night of peace. Ryoko arrives, at the diner. Mm. Ryoko arrives at the dinner at 1am, the diner, sorry, at 1am, one hour later than agreed upon. She has a heavy looking duffel bag under her arm. Koji doesn't feel like asking what the bulges represent. <laughs> Are you just happy to see me? <laughs> That's exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> great, great get minds in the sewer think alike. Ryoko doesn't sound at all apologetic, but Koji decides to just nod expressionlessly. Only a few tables are filled at this hour, like lonely islands in the midst of the vast restaurant. After sending the bleary-eyed waitress away with an order for two coffees, Koji and Ryoko are left all alone in a corner of the dining area. Koji asks bluntly, while sipping dutifully from his third cup of watery, tasteless coffee. Matasetakino in the silence that follows, Koji tries to soothe his parched throat with another mouthful of weak coffee. It's obvious that her grimace isn't for the coffee. Ryoko tries to ignore Koji's question by nursing her coffee, but that only works until the cup is empty. Staring at the brown stain at the bottom of her cup, Ryoko says, her voice hard and flat, Koji replies, smiling bitterly instead of glaring at her like he did before. Orega,まだ先生や文則とは境界線を挟んだ反対側にいるとでも。君はまだ一番致命的なものまでは見ていない。君にとってこの事件は無二の親友がいきなり勝共を失って目覚めたっていうただそれだけの内容なんだろ。
最後の一線を踏み越えていない。Would you consider Ryoko's words calmly without letting himself get emotional like before? The final line, true, Fuminori is somewhere beyond that. Although Koji has gone far enough to be willing to kill Fuminori, he has no intention of eating his enemy's flesh once he's dead. That at least still separates the two. Then what about Ryoko? Who has treated Koji like an ignorant fool ever since she saved him from the well? How close is she to Fuminori? In response to Koji's biting question, Ryoko's mocking smile turns inward. Ryoko pats one of her duffel bag's bulges. Koitsunga <laughs> Where is she going with this? I thought her. Yeah, I thought when she mentioned her dad, I was like, oh, my dad used to know Dr. Ogai. They used to be friends. But she's like, no, nah, this is my dad's gum.、Uh, I nicked it and he got in trouble, got kicked out of his club. So, 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 I'm just, I'm just pulling, I'm just yanking your chain. This story's going nowhere, Koji. Sorry. <laughs> One day, nothing happens. <laughs> Her quick denial isn't what Koji was expecting. So, no, Koroni, I'm more, I know, go to a Ikin Rakshak Stata. Skunak to what I was so motita. Yatsu, a Sunata, okay, Stakiri. More, Nido to what I know, mine, you are our and I, the road to Ansin Stata. この銃で何かを撃とうとか殺そうとかそういう必要があったわけじゃないじゃあなぜ眠れなかったんだよただそれだけ What? Um, I mean I suffer from some pretty bad insomnia at times Do you ever and... feel that you have to get a shotgun and shoot yourself with it? No, it's not shooting yourself I just figure that she just hugs it to sleep A gun? Because she has nightmares. <laughs> I feel like that. I feel like the gun. I feel like none of this makes sense. None of this makes sense. Um, unless she's talking about having nightmares of being attacked by alien, well, monsters, and then she keeps the gun to make her feel safe. Because she knows about aliens and that, because of Saya? I suppose that would make sense. Would it? I think she only just read about Saya right now. Yeah. But if she's been following Dr. Ogai for a while, you must be aware of some stuff. Because if, he, if Saya exists, then aliens exist, and then something that could mean more stuff that、uh, Ryoko's been involved with at some point. Maybe. Ryoko pauses, perhaps needing time to decide how best to explain. それまではベッドサイドにナタを隠しておいたんだ。夜一人で部屋にいるのが耐えられなくてね。I'm sure that's so much better. Yeah, I mean, you, look, if, if you need someone to keep you company, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm lonely too. You get that d a k i m a k u r a then. You get that d a k i m a k u r a then. You get that d a k i m a k u r a then. You get that d a k i m a k u r a then. You get that d a k i m a k u r a then. You get that d a k i m a k u r a then. You get that She could have got a dog, maybe? A guard dog type dog?、Mm. <sighs> I'd, I'd, I'd be worried about it getting John Wicked. <laughs> True. Goji doesn't know what to say. He's amazed, impressed. Even that. Even That someone with such a serious case of delusional paranoia could function as one of T University's top doctors. But that's not enough. 
残弾がもっと広範囲に飛び散るようになって、殺傷力が増す。I see she also enjoys 80s action movies. Why did she cut it down? Like she's not. Sawn off shotgun. Yeah, she's not even sure of what's going to ha like what type of thing she's protecting herself against. I just it seems awfully specific if she knows as if she knows exactly what she's trying to protect herself against. No, it's actually the fear of the unknown is how I'm seeing this. She's like, I want to have something that will protect me. This machete is not enough. A shotgun will do. Oh, but let's enhance it so that it will do as much damage as possible. Hmm. That's the way I've, I've seen her. I've seen this. Well, actually, now that I think about it, if it's sitting in the back of a closet, it's not as easily accessible as she may want. Yeah, I would have thought she would have had it under the pillow or something. Yeah, then again, you don't want to sleep with it. With a loaded gun under your pillow. And people do that though, don't they? Yeah, they're not exactly the most stable of people. Well, you just explained to us how she's not the most stable of people. <laughs> yeah. Insomnia, paranoia. Hmm. A lovely concoction. At this point, Ryoko seems to have gotten everything off of her chest. Smiling like someone who's just finished a hard job, she adds. <laughs> You know, sometimes you can survive that if you do it wrong. Don't tell me that. I don't even want to think about that. Um, <laughs> is this maybe what happened with Dr. Ogai? He shot himself in the head, we saw that. Yeah. Could it be? Oh, you mean this had... paranoia? Yeah. I mm. wonder, I wonder. And the que real question is What caused the paranoia in the first place? I think that's the key thing here. I, I want to know what caused the paranoia in Dr. Ryoko here, because Dr. Ogai was studying Saya. He seemed fine. Dr. Ogai? Yeah, Dr. Ogai, he seemed fine until something made him go crazy. But Ryoko, I don't think she knew about Saya until recently. Or at least what Saya was until recently. Mm, there is a lot left to find out. Let's see where this goes. Thank you for your comments. But, you're not a human being. If you're going to go further, Boji is already doubtful that meeting with Ryoko was the right thing to do. The one thing that he and Ryoko have in common is an unwillingness to leave Fuminori to the proper authorities. Fuminori not only killed Koji's lover and friend, but even went so far as to defile their corpses. Boji isn't about to give him the chance to get off on an insanity plea. No matter what crimes he must commit, Koji will end Fuminori with his own two hands. If he doesn't, he knows that he will never sleep again. It helps to have a partner in crime, but only when that partner doesn't cause trouble. Ryoko talks big about exposing Ogai's secrets, but she might just have a head full of delusions. If so, Koji needs to rethink this whole thing. <laughs> To be honest, Ryoko, the way you're putting things, you're, you're just, you're drawing him in. Yeah, it's, it's she's like tantalizing. <laughs> Like, he's not going to be like, oh, do you know what? You've convinced me. I'm not going to... I'm going to lose my bloodlust for my ex-friend who killed and dismembered my girlfriend. You know? Ryoko smirks and shakes her head ruefully and puts up no further resistance. She pulls a stack of paper from her bag and hands it to Koji. The loose-leaf sheets are bound with string. Well... 
As directed, Koji looks through the handwritten pages, gives up after less than three minutes. Koji deliberately scoffs at the document, doing everything he can to show contempt for what he just read. At the same time, he tries desperately not to remember the mountain of bones in Ogai's bathtub and the unidentifiable smell permeating Fuminori's house. But have we heard about this before? Nope. Ryoko says, coldly ignoring Koji's disdain. やつは大学の機材を無断で使って、こっそり検査をしようとしたらしい。だが、同時を踏んで露見した。そこから先はもう大騒ぎでね。王外が使おうとした機材からさするに、やつはそいつを is that real thing or is that just jargon? Give me a sec. Let me just check. <laughs> uh, P. Bio. Oh. The bio safe, a bio safety level is a set of biocontainment precautions required to isolate dangerous biological agents. Levels. So. Biosafety level 3 is appropriate for work involving microbes, which can cause serious and potential lethal disease via the inhalation route. Uh, a little close to home this year, and last year as well. Yeah, and there's only one level after that, and that's 4. Oh. Uh, interesting. What's it say? No, I've not looked at 4, but I was just like, it's just interesting it actually exists. Um, ah, okay. <laughs> judging by the. その程度の用心で十分だったのかどうかも知れたもんじゃないんだが。近隣の住民を退去させるべきだったんだが、まあそこは偉い人たちが偉い人なりに頑張って全部なかったことにしてくれたよ。using if you remember in the um, notes that he took, he said that Sai started experimenting on rats and changing their DNA. Yes, I do remember that. Mm. Oh, and that it did make some kind of retrovirus. Yeah, did, she did say that. I wonder what that retrovirus was. Hmm. At their first meeting, Ryoko brushed Koji off when he asked about Ogai and Masahiko. Now, however, she's telling the whole story. Her voice is flat and emotionless in the machines. ことの救命には結局皆が作業を投げた。王外が持ち込んだ資料がどういう起源のものなのか誰にも突き止めることはできなかった。まあ結局みんな賢明だったわけだ。理性は理性。ザレゴトはザレゴトそういう線引きを危うくしないで済む程度ってもんを心得ていた。ピケ<笑> Mm. Look at that weird expression. She's like, I want to bear hug someone or something or wrestle. Ever since she got off work, she's just like super hardcore about all of this. Ryoko pauses for a moment and grins with, grins with self disdain so maniacal that it strikes Koji like a blow. <laughs> She found the people he'd been dealing with and who had encouraged him to perform his experiments? 
Yep, that means there's more. この世の理性ってものがどんなに多がの緩んだ穴だらけの頼りない代物なのか理解するようになったのはね。As though fleeing from the quiet insanity that he keeps glimpsing in Ryoko, Boji finds himself paging through the loose leaf in his hands. He reads a line at random. The organism's flesh is not fibrous but reticulated. Put simply, it is an extremely tough substance that expands and contracts not in one direction but in all directions. This means that slashing or piercing damage has very little effect. Since the flesh can contract in any direction freely, any wound will be sealed instantly. It's nonsense. What else can it be? If he lets himself believe it, then everything else, all the logical rules that define the world, will be rendered meaningless. <laughs> この内容疑う理由なんてとっくの昔に見失ったからね。リオコリッチーズはドフォーバーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガーガー Koji snaps, no longer able to disguise his frustration. Saya ga nandaro to mo do demo idis. Oreva fuminori o wara ser kotoga de kiriba sore de i. Anatani wa makase de okemase. Soka. Now that she's given up on persuading him, her ascent is swift and cold. At this moment, Koji's fate has likely ceased to matter to her. I daro. Kimi wa sakisaka fuminori o stomer tameni, zen lyoko tsks to i. Oh, that's nice of you. <laughs> Despite determination in her voice, Oji can't bring himself to trust this paranoid doctor completely. Anata no mochi a wase teiru liu de fuminori o koroseru n desu ka? Kepe ki shou nan da yo, watashi wa. ああやって人の世界の拉致外に隠れ住んでいるような奴らが我慢ならない。奴らは寝室のゴキブリだ。枕元でカサコサハイマール音を見せる。This is weird, right? I'm not gonna sleep well tonight. <laughs> This is a weird thing, though. She's like, I can't stand people like him who lurk outside of the world. Like, she can't sleep at night because of this? What? Well, she has literally not been sleeping well. Because she knows that people like this exist, but it's not like they're going to come after her or anything. Well, she's that paranoid. She's sounding as, almost as mental as Fuminori. Well, let's see where this goes then. <laughs> Her reasons are similar to Koji's own. He doesn't want to bring a murderer to justice, nor does he want revenge for Omi and Yo. If he did, he could have left everything to the police. The reason he can't is that the villain is Fuminori. The man he believed was his friend has turned his whole world upside down. Everything and everyone with a part in this madness is to blame, and that includes himself for allowing the betrayal. His self-loathing, his desire to destroy, is what keeps him, what's keeping him on his feet. さあそれじゃあチェックメイトに駒を進めよう。さきさかくんを呼び出すといい。ゴジノーズ、pulls out his cell phone and calls his friend for what will probably be the last time. The call goes through quickly. Fuminori must have been waiting for it. 待たせたな、フミノリ。こっちの準備は整った。Fuminori must have been quite anxious to hear from Koji. His voice is hard and completely emotionless. <laughs> Koji can't help but smell at Fuminori's disappointment. Perhaps Ryoko's maniacal sadism has rubbed off on him. He's lying, Koji thinks. 
remembering the contents of Fuminori's refrigerator. Just what part of Yo did you eat, huh? Did you carve that poor girl up like a pig? <laughs> As if. Oh, come on. Fuminori hangs up without waiting for Koji's response. Ryoko's praise sounds serious, drawing a glare from Koji. How will she get out? You know, I believe that uh, the boot or the trunk of cars have an interior release. All of them? I don't know if it's all of them, but I feel like it's a thing that they've put in from a certain point for instances like this. Or people mm. accidentally, like kids somehow accidentally closing the boot on themselves or something like that. I need to double check this, but I mean, I've never jumped into the boot of my car and closed the boot, so... Or the trunk. Uh, uh, did I tell you about um, how I got three points of my license many years ago? No, but did you have a guy in the trunk of your car? I had two guys in the boot, five guys in the back seats, uh, and one of my brothers in the passenger seat to the to my left. Dude. Dude. Yeah, it was the RAV4 though, and they were all very comfortable. <laughs> they were comfortable police officers, so please let me go. <laughs> yeah. He... <laughs> he didn't see the good side of that, no? No, no. he was a prick. I but mean, yeah. if, he f if I was a police officer and I stop a car, I'm like, five people in the backseat, two people in the boot. Yeah. Bro, man. Bro, give me a break. I can't let you off for this one. <laughs> uh, those points are long since spent, though. Back to having the clean license. Good stuff. Uh, but yes, I do believe that they have an interior. At least I need to check that, though. Uh, let's see. <laughs> But not in a visual novel. Ah, ha, ha, ha. Oh, yeah. Um, from that experience, I can tell you there was no internal boot release. Yeah, um, I think uh, it was after a certain time, though, but I could be wrong. Um, I need to double check this. With those bold words, Ryoko grabs her duffel bag and rises from her seat. <laughs> She says and tosses him the check. <laughs> what the? F like, what the hell? That's jokes. Is she broke or something? She's a doctor, right? Yeah, she should have cash. Even after Koji arrives at Y Station, I's directed. Minori calls him and makes him change locations three more times. Koji is beginning to doubt that Fuminori is watching. He might just be using the time to guess when Koji arrives at each designated location. Nevertheless, Koji can't let his guard down. Fuminori might choose any moment to make sure that he's alone. If he makes a mistake and puts Fuminori on alert, Ryoko will lose her chance to take him by surprise. He'll just have to put up with the cramped trunk for a little while longer. After the nature preserve and the dry riverbed, the fourth location to which Fuminori sends Koji is in the thick forest at the top of the foothills, high above the developed area at their base. His car's GPS shows a road that leads nowhere, but according to Fuminori, there should be an old abandoned sanatorium there. 
The park and river were empty this late at night, but during the day would likely have considerable traffic. This time, however, his instinct is telling him that it's definitely a place that no one could find, not even by accident. This music's a little bit weirdly cheery. You think so? Do, 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 do. I don't know. Hmm. It looks like this is the final stop. Koji drives up to the steep incline, soon leaving the residential neighbourhood behind. Even though the hands of progress are right at its doorstep, the underdeveloped forest is darker than he expected. This looks like a great place to live in secret, or to kill someone and hide the body. Places like oh, this... <laughs> Places like this, lost and forgotten, aren't found only in deep jungles and hidden valleys. Holes in the world are everywhere, even in the midst of civilization. A broken down gatepost suddenly appears in Koji's headlights, like a ghost rising from the darkness. It looks like this is the final stop. He rolls up to the gate and turns off the engine, giving himself to the silence of the forest. His phone starts ringing almost immediately. He doesn't need to check who it's from. The Minori is nearby, close enough to hear the sound of the engine. A shiver of excitement shoots up Koji's spine. If he was fucking smart, he would be like, I found where he lives, now I'm gonna call the police. Dude, I'd just get like a bunch of machine guns and I'd just fire directly at the building. So you can get machine guns. True. <laughs> Fuminori hangs up with it, but then the, the police problem with the police is um, what proof do you have that he's done anything? First they would have to go to his house to see what's happened, then they'd have to do an investigation. It would take so much time that um, Fuminori probably f figure out something's up when you don't go in for like an hour and then run mm. away. Oh, it'd take longer than an hour. Yeah. Fuminori hangs up without another word. After grabbing his new flashlight from the glove compartment and checking that the revolver is still in his pocket, Koji opens the door, making sure to pop the trunk at exactly the same time. Ryoko shouldn't need any more explanation than that. Realising that the interior roof light will stay on and broadcast that the trunk isn't closed, Koji quickly unscrews the bulb, then gets out of the car and deliberately slams the driver's side door hard. Mountains of trash litter the front yard, forming a serviceable barricade. Isn't that the exact same sentence when they first described it? Yeah. Oji sees everything from small refrigerators, the mopeds, to huge chunks of concrete and plaster that must have been abandoned by construction workers. The fact that they could get away with leaving all this stuff behind shows just how remote this place is. Glancing sidelong at the rear of his car, Koji sees no movement inside the barely open trunk. Ryoko knows what she's doing. She'll probably wait until Fuminori's attention is focused on Koji before making her move. The moon is brighter than usual, allowing Koji to walk through the front yard without tripping on debris. Staying alert, he heads for the building beyond the mountains of trash. Something must be buried underneath the piles of garbage, because the whole yard is filled with the sharp stink of chemicals. Mm. Even the homeless probably wouldn't come to this place. If you need to get out of the wind and rain, there are plenty of shelters more suitable. When he reaches the gaping the gaping doorless entrance to the building, Oji glances back the way he came. His car, parked at the gate, is hidden behind the mountains of trash. Even if Fuminori is watching from inside the sanatorium, he shouldn't be able to see Ryoko crawl out of the trunk. It looks like she'll get her chance to take him by surprise. How many times now has he stood like this, alone in some ominously silent place far removed from his everyday life? Sneaking into deathly quiet houses to find traces of unimaginable happenings has become as normal as going to class. The houses that he explored before were like freshly shed uh, chicada shells, empty and dilapidated but with traces of the life they had sheltered. This place however is different, a perfect ruin its walls and pillars rising from the dark forest like an army of ghosts, no sign at all that people once lived and worked here. The structure resembles a skeleton more than a shell. Time and elements have stripped it of its former shape, 
and now there is only death. Koji has gone as far as he can. This must be the final stop. What will Fuminori's next move be? He must be planning to kill Koji. But how? Just as he's about to turn on his flashlight, Koji reconsiders. If he wanders around the light with the light on, he'll be broadcasting his exact location. That will give the advantage to Fuminori, who's probably lying in wait for him right now. He holds the light before him in his left hand, with his finger poised on the switch. In his right hand, he raises the revolver, keeping it pointed in the same direction. Now ready to fire when he turns on the light, Koji steps quietly into the dark room. It takes a while for his eyes to adjust, but even when they do, he has only moonlight streaming through empty windows to guide him. Everything appears grey and indistinct. However, Fuminori has to deal with the same conditions if he's hiding here. This is a battle of nerves, exhausting and deadly, where the first to make a sound and give away his position will lose. The rooms on both sides of the hallway are all open. Some are even missing their doors. Koji creases up to each entrance, checks to make sure no one is inside, then carefully proceeds on. The stink that he noticed in the garden has changed. Now it smells more organic, like rotting meat. It's the exact same smell that filled Fuminori's house. The organism's fleshy freely, freely expands in a manner that renders piercing damage meaningless. 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 <laughs> the echo is like, meaningless, meaningless, meaningless. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking what they're going... I think what Fuminori is going to do is he's going to have Yo out in the open. And when Koji sees Yo, first of all, he won't recognize her. He'll think, what the hell is that? And they'll use that element of surprise against him. Sounds alright, but I wonder if... Actually, no, they don't care about yours, so yeah, probably. I mean, if... Yeah. Plus, she should be fine. They don't exp... I mean, even a... I don't know how, know how a gun works against these things. I don't know. We'll see what happens. Koji grits his teeth and forces the madman's word out of his head. What good can come of taking them seriously? This isn't the time for such useless... Shh. Ooh. I always freak out when a freaking... Ugh. When it disappears like that. Yeah, when it just freaking appears. Koji freezes and stares down the hall. It was a wet sound that he heard just now. Like someone dragging their feet through a swamp. It came from the room at the end of the hall. Something is there. Something alive. Koji creeps towards the sound, light gun at the ready. Mm. Squish, squish. Now it sounds like someone squeezing mud through their fingers, and as he gets closer, Koji begins to hear breathing. Could it be Fuminori? No, that's impossible. He should be waiting for a chance to ambush Koji, not making careless noise. As he proceeds, the strange sound coming through the cracks in the concrete walls grow clearer. You alright? Before he knows it, he is standing on the threshold. The room is filled with a thick, vicious darkness, just like every other room that he's passed. There is more than just darkness, however. Something is there. He can hear pained breathing. Like that of a wounded animal, and what sounds like sobbing. Sobbing? Koji whispers into the darkness. Now that he's given away his position, he might as well turn on his light. For some reason, however, Koji feels that to do so would have disastrous consequences. Uh oh. I have to click again. <laughs> the last <laughs> time I heard her voice on the phone, she was sobbing. The wheezing suddenly stops. And then... Koji! <laughs> a whisper comes out of the darkness. Though not a human voice, not by any measure, it speaks some blasphemous semblance of human words. A nightmarish flash of insight connects the dots in Koji's mind. Tsukuba! Can't be. 
Yule doesn't sound like this. Doesn't smell like this. But if it's not Yule, then how does it know his name? Why is it begging him for help? No, it can't be Yule. He's human, not some creature that slithers and hides in the shadows. The thing wriggles closer. His reason cries out, imploring him to switch the light on before it's too late, or to turn and run if he cannot. But Koji is unable to make either choice. He can only call out in vain to the amorphous shape in the darkness. Not usually a sane question. Something soft and slimy slides over Koji's toes. Instinct overrides his will, forcing him to turn on his light and shine it at his feet. The white beam reveals everything, the merciless truth that finally shatters Koji's sanity. Terror wipes his mind of all but two words, gun and trigger. His finger responds with instant obedience. There is an explosion of light and sound, both more intense than he anticipated, and then the destructive forces are swallowed up by the darkness. His ears are still ringing from the bang, but he hears a weak voice coming from the shadows. Koji, s <laughs> Koji screams and pulls the trigger again and again, certain that salvation can come only from the barrel of his gun. Light and darkness, explosion and silence. They dance before him three more times. Koji doesn't even need to aim. The horrible creature is right at his feet, far too close to miss. I hope Ru he's keeping count of his ammo. Oh, well, never mind. Ryoko warned him how many bullets were left in the gun, but that information has already been driven from his mind. Even after the cold, heavy gloom wraps itself around him once more, Koji keeps pulling the trigger like a man possessed, paying no heed to the clicking of the empty weapon. His panic-stricken legs suddenly give out, sending him down hard on his backside. Even then, he keeps firing the empty gun. He knows no other way to erase the memory of the thing that he glimpsed in the beam of his flashlight. The light, which fell from his hand during the attack, is now pointing in a different direction, and though all four bullets must have hit their target, they were Koji's last card to play, which leaves him alone in the darkness with no way to defend himself. And just as he realises this, a mass of rotting flesh rolls over him like a tidal wave. He can no longer even scream as the thing pushes him onto his back. <laughs> With fear seizing his throat in an iron grip, Koji struggles desperately against the monster as it crawls up his body towards his face. Covering his face with his left hand, he scrabbles wildly along the floor with his right, searching for a way out that doesn't exist. His mind is that of a feral animal, empty of everything but primal terror. And that is why, when his right hand closes around something hard at that last moment, he recognises it instinctively as a weapon. Putting every ounce of strength into his arm, Koji swings the heavy object at the creature on top of him. He hears the thud of a blunt object striking something soft and wet, and then Koji's attacker rolls off him. As soon as he's able to move again, Koji leaps to his feet and grabs his new weapon with both hands, brandishing it like a charm to ward off evil. Only now does he realise that he's holding a rusty steel pipe. The monster is still sobbing. With a cry that is part scream, part roar, Koji raises the steel pipe and brings it crashing down on the cowering creature. He, wears a wet, he hears a wet sound and feels the blood chilling sensation of its thick, soft flesh absorbing the blow. These combine to evoke an instinctive loathing that wipes his mind of all but the urge to destroy. Consumed by the same desperation with which he kept firing the empty gun, Koji rains blow after blow down on his enemy. After the tenth blow, it stops sobbing, 
After the 12th, 20th blow, it stops moving, and after the 30th blow, it begins to feel and sound more and more like he's beating a puddle of vicious liquid. Goji doesn't stop thrashing the creature until he recovers enough of his senses to realise that whatever it may have been before, it is now nothing but a corpse. The pipe in his hand, covered with unidentifiable fluids and filth, suddenly feels unbearably heavy. Ryoko's voice plays back in his head, and at last he knows how merciful her warning was. Now that his eyes are as open as hers, he is able to laugh in contempt of his own foolishness. Twenty years of memories in the light of the sun. If they were indeed precious to him, then he should never have come to this place. Black flames of despair rise within him, consuming fear and revulsion and pity. Only rage and hate remain. Every cell in his body cries out for vengeance, for the blood of the man who poisoned him with truth and tore him from the womb of innocence. And then Koji, slave to hate, hears the sound of someone sneaking up behind him. Koji whirls, swinging his pipe with all the force he can muster. His enemy hastily leaps back to avoid the strike. Surprised by his failure to catch Koji off guard, twisted shadows dance to the beam of the light on the floor. Readying his pipe for the next blow, Koji faces off against his second attacker. Before this moment, Koji could never have imagined that he would ever speak his friend's name with such hatred. Mm -hmm. Even now, Fuminori is smiling, as though the huge axe in his hand is just a sick joke. <laughs> But he sneers too, unable to contain his contempt for the notion. Kuminori growls, looking sadly at the pile of dead flesh of Koji's. Koji no bunzai de boku no yo hidoi mi awase ya natte. The blade of Fuminori's axe carves a murderous arc through the darkness, glittering menacingly in the faint light coming from the floor. Koji raises his plate to block the ferocious swing. The heavy impact numbs his arms, but his large frame takes a blow without giving any ground. Fuminori presses the attack, delivering a second blow and a third. The axe designed for chopping down trees is deadlier and more durable than the pipe Koji found discarded on the floor. Each strike Koji blocks sends chunks of rust flying from his makeshift weapon. He can't win as long as he's on the defensive. He needs to create an opportunity to attack. Come on! Koji blocks a crushing downward swing, then pushes back hard before Fuminori can pull away, throwing him off balance. Fuminori stumbles backward, then plants his feet to steady himself. Taking advantage of his opponent's temporary immobility, Koji delivers a punishing low kick to Fuminori's outer thigh. Fuminori grunts and retreats, swinging his axe wildly to prevent Koji from following up with another attack. Koji, however, does not press his advantage. He just stands where he is, calmly spearing Fuminori with his stare. <laughs> Fuminori roars think... and cut. Oh, yeah? Sorry about that. I was just about to say, I don't think he's been in any kind of fight like this, though. No, I don't think he's been in. I mean, I feel like this guy's not been in fights before. I don't know about Koji. Was Koji an ex fucking gang member or something like that? Or just go to school in that area. Fuminori roars and comes in for another attack, but the damage to his right leg seems to be slowing his swing. Easily blocking the axe with his pipe, Koji waits for Fuminori to exhaust himself. <laughs> Fuminori delivers blow after heavy blow, howling savagely all the while. What he does not realise, however, is that the situation now favours composure, not brute force. When Fuminori raises his axe high for yet another attack, Koji sees that his movements have grown dull enough 
Seizing the opportunity, Koji charges into Fominita's range and grabs the haft of the axe with his left hand. The haft? Yeah, the, uh, the, the stick bit of the, the axe. Hmm, the handle, yeah. As Fominita recoils in fear, Koji swings his pipe hard at his enemies in protected sight. He feels the crunch of ribs breaking. <laughs> Pain drives Fuminori to his knees, staring down at Fuminori's defenseless head. Koji, surprised by his own lack of emotion, raises his pipe high to deliver the finishing blow. Can I, I bet you I know what's going to happen now. Yeah. Which is when something wraps itself around his left ankle. Mm-hmm. The instant Koji panics at the unexpected sensation, something soft yet strong winds itself around his right leg and drags him to the floor before he can resist. He twists his body and tries to swing the pipe at the unseen enemy behind him, but his right hand too is seized by the same flexible force. He wasn't able to feel it through his pants, but now his blood turns to ice at the cold, slimy sensation of the thing wrapped around his uncovered wrist. That monster's still alive? Fuminori says encouragingly. Even while kneeling on the floor, his face twisted in pain, he manages a terrible, victorious grin. Saya. This monster is Saya. Koji struggles desperately to free his limbs from the creature's slimy grip, but more tentacles swarm over his body, stealing his freedom of movement. <laughs> the horror has already driven Koji half mad. Just imagining the creature's appearance is enough to send him into a mindless panic. His scream is suddenly cut off as a slimy appendage sieges his throat. This most deadly tentacle isn't just cutting off his windpipe, it's trying to snap his neck and it's getting tighter. Koji is certain that this is the end, but just as his vision begins to dim, an explosion brings him back to his senses. With a horrifying, inhuman scream, the creature releases Koji and retracts his tentacles. The first thing he sees after regaining his mobility is Ryoko running down the hall with a smoking shotgun in one hand and a silver tube in the other. Caesar! Ryoko responds by tossing him the tube. Though still lying on the floor, he manages to snatch it out of the air. It's the thermos she showed him at the restaurant, the one she called her secret weapon. Ryoko shouts to Koji. At the same time, she aims a gun at Fuminori, who's still on his knees five paces away. The double-barreled shotgun still has one shot loaded. The monster that attacked Koji is writhing in agony. It hasn't yet recovered from Ryoko's shot, but he's already seen that bullets aren't enough to kill these creatures. Now is his only chance. Fuminori growls, gritting his teeth against the pain of his broken ribs. Forcing himself to be calm, Koji stands and carefully unscrews the lid of the thermos. There's no question in his mind that something extremely potent is inside. As soon as it is unsealed, a thick white mist pours out of the thermos and the surrounding air turns freezing cold. Instantly guessing what's inside, Koji lobs the thermos at a pile of flesh convulsing on the floor. The thermos sails through the air, spewing white fog and like a baptismal font showers its liquid contents upon the hellish creature. Its scream this time is incomparable to before. The monster thrashes in agony, wreathed in a white smoke. Its screams are joined by Ryoko's cackling. <laughs> Perhaps the joy of vanquishing her nightmare was worth the last remnants of her sanity. The manic glee blazing in her eyes can belong only to a shattered mind. Fuminori staggers to his feet, roaring black curses. His rage seems to have drowned out the pain of his broken bones. Ryoko is not one to underestimate the threat posed by his axe. Her mad laughter fades away, leaving only a cold smile as she pulls the trigger. With a short burst of dark flame, Ryoko's gun sputters and dies. Ryoko is not an, exper an expert in firearms. It never occurred to her that shotgun shells need proper storage. And besides, she always expected that any situation where her gun would be necessary would also be one that she would not survive. 
cursing in anger and dismay, Ryoko breaks the shotgun open and awkwardly pulls out the dud. Meanwhile, Fuminori stalks toward her like a vengeful demon, the head of his axe screeching as it drags along the floor. I have to stop him. Boji tries to charge Fuminori, but only succeeds at sending himself sprawling. One of his shoes is stuck to the floor, frozen by the liquid nitrogen. As Ryoko fumbles in her pockets for a new shell, Fuminori closes the distance and raises his axe in both hands. Boji curses and rips his shoe free of the frozen concrete, but he knows that he'll never make it in time. Ryoko thrusts a new shell into the chamber of her shotgun and snaps it closed, then looks up to find her target. Fuminori is right before her, too close to evade, and his axe is already crashing down with the wind howling in its wake. The sounds of bone shattering, tendon snapping and flesh tearing blend together in foul harmony. The thick blade enters through Ryoko's left shoulder, ploughing through her collarbone and shoulder blades, smashing several ribs and popping her lung like a balloon before stopping in the centre of her chest. Her expression frozen and shot by the impact, she sprays a geezer of blood from her mouth. She should have died instantly. But through some unimaginable force of will, Ryoko clings to life for a few seconds more. Grinning through bloodstained lips, she raises her shotgun. Not to the front, but to the side. Beyond the barrel of her gun, wearing the 77 degree Kelvin mist like a white cloak of death, is a weakly wriggling sire. <laughs> Minori's scream vanishes into the roar of the shotgun. Ooh. The destruction is absolute. The impact of the shotgun pelts obliterate the half of Saya's body that fell prey to the liquid nitrogen. The frozen particles of Saya's shattered flesh drift to the floor like snow. Even the creature's special biology is insufficient to seal a wound of this size. From the opening pores and internal organs, a tide of liquid, slime and fat whose colour is far too foul to belong to any living creature. The monster convulses, wailing in a weak, pitiful voice. Saya. What is this fucking heavenly white background now? I don't know, man. He's supposed to be distraught now. <sighs> With his axe still buried in Ryoko's body, Kuminori stares at the dying creature, his expression utterly devoid of emotion. Boji grabs his pipe and prepares to attack Fuminori from behind, but freezes when he sees the emptiness in the face of the man he hated. Fuminori pulls his axe out of Ryoko's corpse, then looks at Koji with glazed eyes. There is no recognition in them, nor hate, nor rage. When Koji meets Fuminori's blank stare, he knows. There is nothing left in him to kill. Fuminori grips the axe closer to its head and raises it high, the blade, toward his face. <gasps> Koji doesn't know whether he should interfere, but even if he wanted to, what could he say to stop Fuminori? Fuminori pulls his head back slowly, then drives his face into the blade of the axe like a spring-loaded toy. His skull caves in with a dull, wet sound, and the spray of blood catches Koji in the face. Despite Fuminori's utter lack of hesitation, his first attempt at suicide succeeds only in transforming his face into a hash of crimson. Fuminori mm. pulls his bed back one more time, even slower than before. Then, with every ounce of strength still left in his body, he slams it into the blood-stained axe. The sound is wetter than before. Fuminori's body goes limp, then tumbles face first to the floor. Koji stares at the two mangled corpses for a while. He feels completely left behind, like he can't remember why he's standing in this place with a steel pipe in his hand. The steel air filling the ruined building becomes choked with the stench of blood, and the crimson puddles gradually spread across the snow-covered floor, yet the tranquility of the scene makes it seem like a painting. A soft, slimy sound breaks the silence. Koji looks at the mortal, mortally wounded monster. The creature is on death's door, but even so, it moves. 
slowly, feebly, drags his broken body through the sea of blood. It's coming for Fuminori. Koji had forgotten his anger, but now it comes surging back at full force. Shineo. He growls and stabs the monster with the end of his pipe. It convulses in agony but keeps crawling towards Fuminori. Koji explodes into a frenzy of rage. Again and again he smashes the helpless flesh beast with his pipe. Something tells him that if he does not stop it here, he will truly have lost. The monster, however, never succumbs. It struggles on beneath his blows until finally it reaches Fuminori's corpse. Koji keeps swinging, his fury unabated even as tears start to pull in his eyes. The monster slime flies through the air, joining with the blood already covering his face. The creature extends one thin, trembling tentacle to touch Fuminori's shoulder, then lovingly caresses his blood-stained cheek. And then, it stops moving. Even in its final moments, the monster would not let Fuminori go. It died, joined with him. At last, Koji knows that the world he loved is gone forever. Uh, why do we go sleep? Chunks of her body are missing, as though something's been nibbling on her and makes her look a lot thinner. She's been worried about her weight recently, now she shouldn't need to diet. <laughs> He sounds amused, but it's hard to tell from his expression, since his face has been cleaved in two by an axe. I mean, you're not wrong. What is this? I don't know, man. Omi and Yo laugh at Fuminori's dumb joke. Yo never used to laugh with such exuberance. She seems truly happy now that she and Fuminori are officially together. でも、いきなりケットを殺せたの?思い切り振り回して、斧頭の重さに任せて叩きつける感覚とか。海のりにそう言われたもんだからさ、騙されたと思ってやってみたわけよ。そうしたらもう楽しくって。What is this feeling? Something is wrong, though Koji can't put his finger on what. Ah, that's it. When he sees Yo's envious smile, Koji finally realizes what's bothering him. Yo tilts her head quizzically, like she doesn't understand what he means. You know, nods in understanding. He replies, deflecting Koji's confusion with that uncannily cheerful smile. Oh, of course. Koji looks down and is satisfied to see wriggling tentacles where his arms and legs should be. 
When he opens his eyes, his mattress and pillows are, and pillow are soaked in sweat. It's always the same nightwear. He doesn't know how many times he's had it, but at least he's not leaping out of bed screaming anymore. He sits up, clutching his throbbing head. It's four in the morning. He hasn't had nearly enough rest, but he probably won't be able to get back to sleep tonight. Time for a smoke. A full pack will last him until dawn. Now, where did he put that pack he bought yesterday? Koji wanders sleepily into the den, where yet another old friend is waiting for him. Ryoko's chopped up corpse is sitting at his dining table, looking as deathly pale as ever as she sips coffee from a mug. Hallucinations like these are easier to deal with than elaborate nightmares like the one he just had. It should probably worry him more though. Ryoko chuckles, smelling the same cruel manic smell that she used used to when she was alive. Her left ugh, her left arm hangs from her half severed shoulder, dangling like a forgotten wind chime. So, ケッコオリアイをつけてるんだ。先生だってそうだったんでしょう。普段は優秀な農芸会で通用してたんだから。the corpse shrugs her intact right shoulder and grimaces in disgust as she takes another sip of her coffee. でもね、多分この先はもっと悪くなるよ。心の傷は時間が癒してくれるけど、君はまあ言ってみれば毒に感染したようなものだから。She's probably right. Everyone dreams at night. No matter how dim the memories may get, the nightmares will always be there to tear into, Koji's f with fr into Koji with fresh fangs. The insanity that has taken root in his heart will grow, eventually consuming everything that's left inside of him. Koji nods, smiling confidently, then stands and walks to the bathroom where he retrieves the weapon that he keeps hidden behind the mirror. <laughs> Ogai's revolver, the one souvenir that Koji brought back from the other world that night. In the mirror, Koji sees Ryoko with her axe inflicted gash reversed. She raises her mug in a toast to Koji's resourcefulness. This time, it's Koji who shrugs his shoulders. He uses both, exercising his privilege. Fiverr. <laughs> the corpse in the mirror nods sagely, her smile approving. There is a brief silence. Koji doesn't really feel like getting all melancholy with a dead woman. And Koji turns around halfway through his sentence. He realizes that the room is empty for the silence of the night. <sighs> so, Koji returns to the world of the scene. He lights his first cigarette of the night and takes a deep drag. While sitting alone in his den, puffing on his smoke, he stares at the gun in his hand. He knows just how precarious a cliff he's standing on. The final line of which Ryoko spoke is now one step behind him. Koji no longer has anything to protect his soul. 
Now that Ogai Masahiko's fantasies and Tanbor Ryoko's delusions have all become tangible horrors, he knows what insanity and despair truly are. Back in the real world, Takisaka Fuminori is wanted for several gruesome murders. It didn't take long for someone to discover the stockpiles of human meat in the empty Sakisaka and Suzumi homes, and the two refrigerators were found the remains of Suzumi Yosuke, his wife and daughter, Takahata Omi. They found the clothes and other effects of Tsukuba Yo, but were unable to locate any trace of her among the various body parts, a fact that made Koji's nightmares all the more vivid. Dr. Tanbo Ryoko of the Tea University Hospital vanished mysteriously around the same time. Because she was Fuminori's chief physician, the police have been investigating her connection to his crimes. As for the two corpses secretly buried in the backyard of a certain room, well, they'll probably never be found. This incident will become just another cold case. Oji alone knows what really happened. He has no intention of revealing it. Not now, and not ever. Ogai's writings were not nonsense, which means that everything else was. What fool was it who said that men are the lords of creation? Those who can believe in paltry things like human wisdom and valour are those lucky innocents who have not looked into the abyss. Oji can no longer share in their blessed ignorance. He knows he has been defiled by the insanity called truth, and he will never believe again. If he has been poisoned, as Ryoko's ghost said, then that poison is none other than the truth itself. Just as pure oxygen is harmful to the body, the naked truth has the power to destroy men's minds. Only by diluting it with lies and taking it in small doses, humans maintain a healthy soul. Words once spoken by the living Tanbo Ryoko passed through Koji's mind. That, without a doubt, was a comfort that she kept hidden in her bosom, the only thing that allowed her to face her dreams each night. Koji has taken his predecessor's lesson to heart, prepared for anything. One bullet is always behind the bathroom mirror, promising him salvation. Oh, there we go. Oh. Holy shit. There we are. We're about you again. You think that's the proper ending, though? Yeah, well. It's an ending. There's another still. Yes, there is. Oof. What do you think? I feel emotionally drained. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I kind of thought that Fuminori and um, Saya would escape or something. Hmm. I didn't expect almost everyone to get annihilated. I mean, even, what's his name? Koji's going to go soon, isn't he? Yeah, he's not got long. He, eventually, he's going to take the oh. salvation. Yeah, that's one way of putting it. What, what did we just play, man? What is this? Sayano Uta. So grim. You think it's worth um, going through the other route? Definitely, but I don't think we can do that right now, considering it's about half two in the morning. Yeah. Um. Damn it. Oh. Hmm. I mean, this was definitely an interesting visual novel. Grim as hell. Developed by Nitro Plus. So I, I know you were complaining, saying that, oh, how can they say that amongst all the horror, there's something beautiful in this? Yeah. I could sort of see it, but it's not the typical sort of 
beauty you'd associate with the word beauty, if you know what I mean. I still don't see it, man. Like, <laughs> I get that she had a genuine... First of all, like, they hint towards all these things about... Um, uh, music to soothe the soul. Yeah, this music. Um, One second, let me just... Uh... Oh, well. Um, I don't know. You know... I get that the relationship was, you know, some people might see that as, you know, a beautiful relationship between Saya and Fuminori, you know, ignoring the horrible, crazy shit they were doing. But it just felt um, like an unhealthy relationship. Um, it was. It did, I didn't see beauty in that. I just saw people that really needed, both like two people or two beings that needed help. No, the real beauty was in the the philosophy of just keep the gun. <laughs> <laughs> so harsh, so harsh. I don't know. Like, I I get they're trying to pull on the the kind of heartstrings with her, kind of like like crawling towards Fuminori even as she's dying and in pain. But yeah, I was just like, I don't know, man. I, I suppose Saya can possibly get a pass because she's kind of like she doesn't understand morality the way humans do she's not human so mm. fair enough but did she just does, does so many things that you, to hate her right that I just uh, when she was getting smashed I was like yeah Koji fucking girl yeah! smash her to pieces I don't give a shit um, mm. I feel really bad for um, yo yeah, she was the one who was like a proper victim in all of this. Yeah, it's like, what was her crime? She liked an idiot? Basically. I mean, plenty of people like stupid idiots. No fucking get murdered for it. I was just like, she was just so... And then what was her reward? Like, it wasn't... They didn't even kill her. They just like... It was even worse than death. Before she that died. Is... Well, yeah, before she died, she was just... Yeah. yeah. But then, yeah... He got, she got killed. I don't know, man. And that was that. I feel like... Now, I don't know anything about... You know, story writing and stuff like that, but... I just feel like... They could have done more with the relationship between... Um, Luminari and Saya to make you a bit more sympathetic and a kind of... You hate to be sympathetic, but still feel sympathetic towards them type of way. Um, I think they did too many bad things and the relationship just seemed kind of like unhealthy at every level. Um, like from her appearance to the way they relied on each other, like it was just pure desperation. So I mean, I, the, the relationship itself, I'd argue that the nature of the relationship itself and stuff like the way Saya presented herself was all specifically designed to make you get that horrid feeling of this is wrong. And it did, it worked, but like I'm not feeling this kind of horrible beauty. <laughs> you know, I'm there's I'm not feeling the beauty in this in this uh, horror. I don't know. Um that's maybe because I couldn't, I can't get past all the shitty things that they did, especially with the kid, man. What the hell? Like with the kid? Yeah, the kid was killed and sliced up as well. The next door neighbor's kid. Ah, uh, well, the kid was killed by the neighbor. So. so that makes it okay. It doesn't make it okay. It's just that it's not like Fuminori had anything to do with it. But she did say so. Fuminori said. We've killed the dad. We have to kill the the wife and the kid. Yeah, but I know was... that intention was there. Yeah, so no pass. He does not get yeah. a pass. <laughs> um, and Fumino, do you know what I think it is right? Saya can kind of forgive. She does come across as you know I'm doing this because I care for you, Fuminori, right? And she is like amoral. She doesn't understand the morality of humans. Um. 
and got we don't even know that we don't even know what she is there was like all these hints towards her being some extraterrestrial thing she was hinting towards like her maturing and then something big happening um so that was stopped i don't know maybe but, if we do the, the the other option maybe we will see that yeah but i think um one thing you are forgetting or at least not giving enough weight to is that at the end of the day, Fuminori did have issues. And I'm not talking about like anger or stuff like that, but he literally couldn't perceive the world in front of him. And with Saya, he at least had some sort of hope that he could have a world that's normal again. I know that he ended up going down a dark path and then things got really fucked up, but at the end of the day, it was all in service of trying to get some kind of normal life again. I can get that, but I can get wanting to have a normal life. I can get him wanting to live in a um, on his own, a, away from yeah. people. But he was self-aware that he uh -huh. is not seeing people how they are. Right? Yes. He knows that. And yet he was like, Oh, uh, they're not human. Like he made this, he had this like uh, speech near the end when they were in the sanatorium. With Sai. Yeah. Like, they, I don't see them as human. They're not human anymore. And it's like, you know that you can't see people normally. You know this. But why <laughs> are you making this BS excuse? Fumirori I, I, and the way he treated his friend um, Koji as well. Like there was no, there's no ounce no ounce of anything in him to make you sympathetic it's not like you know how you have uh antagonist characters and you do feel a sympathy because there's something there there's elements of good still in them i didn't see any of that in fuminori besides his obsession with saya and <laughs> that's why i was like no man like it's not like he's showing if he showed some remorse some hesitation an ounce of humanity like you know, he knows he that... Did show, he did show at some points a bit of hesitation. At the very least, I can give him that. But it's not... I know it's not good. It's not good. He's not a good person. No, he's, not, he's not even a mixed person. You know, it's not like he's got... He's overall bad, but there's, there's elements of good. It's not like... Um, like the bad guys that you had and stuff like Hunter x Hunter and stuff like that where... Oh no, I'm not going to use that. I would say that uh, Fuminori, if you ask me, is a shade of grey. I wouldn't put him as like all the way... But the only thing is that it, it's a very dark shade of grey because it's coming from an area of like having a mental condition. He can't really perceive the world properly and i know he does understand that he doesn't perceive the world properly but like you said early on when things look sound and smell super unpleasant it does something to you but he just like norm you would keep away from people which is what he was doing which um, is what he was doing and he didn't kill anyone right for three months uh it was only after like so he was drawn to killing people. When was the first person he killed? So Omi was not killed by him. That was Saya. Yeah. And then he ate her. He didn't realize who she what, what she was. It was Yosuke, the neighbor. And that was because Yosuke was attacking Saya. Yeah, and that that's fair enough. But it's like how... That was, yeah, that was when he went, oh shit, we're going to have to take the wife and kid out. And then she's like, don't worry, they're already out of the picture. Yeah. And he's like, we'll take the wife and kid out. But it's how he jumps to that so readily. Like, his character never hesitates with these things. And that's what annoys me. Because there is some hesitation. So he feels a little bit bad uh, at kind of like being harsh with Yo. But I feel like even though he can't stand her and stuff like that. And I can understand I can understand the decisions he makes. So he made the decision to break up with her in, in a way that she goes away and doesn't bother him again. He never shows any hesitation. He's totally emotionless at, at points, and he's just like, "Oh, I feel better." And so, I'm like, "No, I feel like even if you've lost, even if you're suffering the way you're suffering, um, you would feel 
okay, he did feel a little bit bad about Yo for a second, so I'll give him that. But like, after killing Yosuke in self-defense, he's just like, oh, we need to kill the wife and child. No hesitation whatsoever. I mean, I'd, mm, it was bad, but I took that as more of a this is what needs to be done thing rather than uh, he takes glee in this. Yeah, I'm not saying he's enjoying it, but I'm just like, he just goes from zero to, he goes from like, uh, oh, I've saved you, Saya, to I have no emotions and don't give a shit about anything in this world now. Um, he was already halfway there I at the know. beginning. There's nothing, and that's maybe I'll accept that, uh, you know, in reality, that's more realistic with a person in his condition. But as a person watching this, and you'll never fully understand that position, right? Granted, they show you the kind of what he sees and stuff like that. You just don't feel. I feel that this this game is trying to go with the. This is like a person who's been forced into this position by an accident, and he's just trying to make something out of his life, and he falls into um, dark ways just by happenstance. <clears throat> But you need to feel some sort of sympathy for him, right? For that to be effective. Like an ounce of sympathy. So you can balance it out with like, oh, the hatred or anger or disgust you have for all the other things he does. And I'm like, I didn't feel bad at all. He just came across as a, an extremely horrible person. And he even seemed like a horrible person. It was so bad that he seemed like a horrible person before the accident as well. Like, remember, we were thinking, was he that yeah, bad before the I accident? Was, I still think that there was something there. And you're I just don't like us into it, but yeah, yeah. It's just you seem like a complete asshole even before you had the accident, and that's where I'm like, he doesn't seem like a character where there's anything that you makes you want to sympathize with him because this game is trying to get you to sympathize with him and Saya on a level of some sort. And I was just like, as soon as they died, I was like, good. The only thing that disappointed me was Yo had to die, and that we didn't get to find out what uh, Saya's ultimate goal was. So mm. I, was just, I don't feel any sympathy. I don't feel the beauty. I'm just like these were two, two people. Okay, they were in weird. They were forced into certain circumstances beyond their their control. But um, Saya, I can give a pass to because she's not even human. But Luminari, I was like, fuck this guy. I want this guy to like suffer super hard, especially how he treats um, Yo. I'm like, what, does him suffering all this time, like he's got Saya, someone who loves him, so he's he's surviving on that. Why did he have to be a complete bastard to you? Like a complete and utter bastard. So I, Yeah, I, that was, that was, uh, while it wasn't even his idea, he did sort of jump right into that and think, yes, this is fine. And he used her as bait mm. for Koji. And granted, he was like, he felt bad, but he kind of felt bad because his his wiener slave had freaking died rather than him truly caring for her. It's like, mm. you used her as bait. You're a scumbag. I thought this was your family. If you cared for your family, even if it was a fucked up family, then I'd start. And this is where I'm like, I don't, I feel like they've, um, they didn't give him enough uh, good traits or, or things to make you sympathize with them enough for you to feel like this is such a awkward dilemma moral dilemma to it's like do you, you feel bad for him but you know that you know you, that, that kind of dilemma you fall into then where it's like you can kind of see where they're coming from with his character you can kind of see the good in him or you understand that he's gone this way because of how he's suffering and all this shit i'm just like no nah, i feel nothing for fuminari I want him to absolutely fucking get slated, right? And I want it to happen a hundred times over because he's a scumbag. <laughs> so, I don't feel anything for him. Maybe I'm just harsh, but uh, all I'll say is fuck Fuminori. <laughs> and yeah. I think on that note, <laughs> uh, we'll leave it there. Uh, the next vid So this is maybe the proper ending? I don't know. Might not be. Well, there's one more. There is another ending which we haven't gone through yet, unless that route just sort of ends up in the same place. Yeah, so what we'll do is uh, well, we'll end this video for now, but the next video, whenever that comes out, 
uh, we'll explore the option of just phoning Fuminori directly instead of going to Ryoko first. Yeah. And we'll see where that goes. But hope you guys enjoyed this. This has been one hell of a ride. I mean, not too long of a ride, but still one hell of a fucking ride. Uh, a real bumpy ride. Yeah, I went into this totally blind, not knowing what the hell this was about, and uh, got uncensored content. That scared the shit out of me. Um, <laughs> so that was fun. But no, this has been interesting. Definitely an interesting visual novel. Uh, definitely looking forward to trying some more in the future, but yeah, we'll see you later. Happy New Year as well. First. Happy New Year. So I'm Ashman. And I'm Quixel. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye-bye.